through the afternoons, ladies in white dresses and large hats would move from room to room and drink tea and uh, his manservant would come in and the air would be full with bright Edinburgh chatter of what was going on at that time. And uh, really it was a slice of Edinburgh life, once glimpsed and now gone. They were, of course, impossibly elegant, but I think he paints them as objects of beauty rather than as individuals with whom he would have a personal relationship. Everything is serene, everything's quiet, nothing's out of place. Mm. When outside these windows, certainly in the 1920s and 1930s, when socialism was sweeping Scotland, mm. great demonstrations were taking place, marches of unemployed men. It's as if he wanted to keep the real world at bay and just exist in a quiet, harmonious setting of self-created beauty. And champagne corks. And champagne corks. <laughs> yes. And uh, even today, Edinburgh is quite a grey city, and somebody like that would stand out amazingly. Meanwhile, Ferguson and Margaret Morris were setting the fashion on the French Riviera. After the war, they'd returned to the Cap d'Antibes, where Margaret opened a successful dance school. Mr. Sella, owner of the Hotel du Cap, persuaded her to help launch the first opening of his hotel during the hot and normally deserted summer months. His um, life was really completely dominated by Margaret and her various dance enterprises. Um, he loved women and he loved painting the nude. And Margaret and her, her dance schools, her summer schools, provided him with an inexhaustible uh, source of um, subjects for his painting. And he never really, I think, saw the need to look beyond that in, in any way. Ferguson encouraged Peplow and Cadell to come and work on the Côte d'Azur. He promised them intense colour, and they found it. The endless hours of hot sunshine enabled them to paint day after day in conditions they rarely found back home. Hunter arrived in the south of France from Glasgow, where he'd been staying with his sister, recovering from overwork and the bouts of heavy drinking that accompanied his creative frustration. The Riviera transformed his mood. Hunter loved the Côte d'Azur. Material for his work was everywhere, including an abundant supply of brightly coloured, fresh-cut flowers, on which he spent most of his modest income. But for him, it paid off, producing some of his finest and most distinctive work. Back home, people weren't too sure. It was all too bright, too modern, too intense, too French. I have been in St Paul a week and I've just got into a new little studio attached to this hotel where I can paint still life as well as landscape. Fruit is just coming on and flowers are abundant.
This is painter's country. This is the Colon d'Or, now a highly exclusive hotel, but once upon a time an artist-friendly auberge with studios attached. When Hunter came here, he could live and work here for 40 francs a day. And if he couldn't afford the 40 francs, he'd give him a painting instead. It turned out to be a highly lucrative idea. The hotel is littered with paintings and sculptures by the likes of Picasso, Calder, Matisse. And, of course, George Leslie Hunter. I'm in love with this country. It is like California, only cooler, and is commencing to be known as a summer resort. I'm sorry I did not discover it sooner. It must be the best part of Europe, with sunshine every day, fruit, flowers, fine colours, and everything the heart could desire. A pleasant change from the Glasgow weather. Judging by the amount of work that Hunter left behind at the column door, he must have been strapped for cash most of the time. There's, there's just a selection of, of the various pictures, paintings, drawings that he left to Monsieur Roux and the, and the hotel. I mean, all different sort of qualities. Hats. A lot of hats. He loved hats. Women in hats. Um, and the local one, that, that's... Um, I quite like that. It's women washing in the sort of communal washing laundry area, which is just outside the hotel, which shows how this place is... Saint Paul de Vence has changed so much, so smart now. Another portrait. And this one here, this is actually a real cracker and very different, I think, to a lot of Hunter that I've seen. It's almost like a bonheur, very flattened perspective and terrific use of colour there. You see, it has very bold, strong, vigorous splodges of colour in there to create something that really, really is lively and energetic and really beautiful. And that's just colour creating the form there. One less successful here. <laughs> this one's actually been put on the back of a painting by Monsieur Roux, who was the man who ran the hotel, so he's got his priorities right. This was this was a Roux painting with a with a hunter behind it. I think I prefer the hunter. Hunter, when he was in Saint Paul de Vence, he was painting all the time. But he was away from his friends, from his sister. There was no one to pull him out of the studio to actually get him to sleep, to get him to eat. And he worked and worked. And apparently, the bouts of um, arguing with himself and shouting um, disturbed quite a lot of people. He was rapidly going downhill. And he had some turpentine in a bottle of wine. And one night, um, he drank the turpentine, the turps instead of the, the wine, and he was very ill. He was in hospital in Nice. His sister came to get him and took him back to Glasgow. And he probably lived maybe about another year, year and a half after that. I don't think his health ever recovered. Hunter lived long enough to see the exhibition in Paris in 1931, where his paintings were shown alongside those of his friends Cadell, Ferguson and Peplow. It was a great success, and the French government bought one of his paintings of Loch Lomond. Hunter said, I've been kicking at the door for so long, and at last it's beginning to open. In December of that same year, he doubled up with pain whilst working in his studio. Instead of going to the doctor, he carried on with his painting of a magnificent bouquet of flowers he'd just been given. By the time he reached the hospital, it was too late, and he died of blood poisoning due to a burst gallbladder. He was the first of the colorists to die, aged 54. The painting remained unfinished on its easel, a testament to Leslie Hunter's lifelong love of color.
Peplow had gone from strength to strength. He'd been elected a member of the Royal Scottish Academy and asked to teach at the Edinburgh College of Art, places in the past he'd tried to avoid. He was the only one of the colourists to make a living during the Depression. For Caddle, it was a different story. Caddle's paintings were less and less popular in the late 1920s. As the value of Peplow's work increased, Bunty found it harder and harder to sell his paintings. In 1928, he had to leave his beloved front room here and move up to the top floors of the building, and eventually had to leave the place altogether and settle in a much less fashionable part of Edinburgh. He had to sell his furniture in order to raise funds. At Christmas 1933, he organised an exhibition. Fifteen of his paintings sold for a grand total of £78. He certainly borrowed money quite often. Various other people said he, he, he used to uh, you know, give somebody something and say, lend me some money. No. And I think a lot of people did. They were, he was rather a kind of darling of the rich Edinburgh lot. Mm. And amused them a lot. Amused he's very them. I think he sang for his supper, really. Bunty's unhappiness was compounded when Peplow, his friend and inspiration, became seriously ill, eventually dying in 1935 weakened from a thyroid operation. He was 64. Towards the end of his life, he produced, I think, some of the most exciting landscapes um, in, in Persia. He, he found a new place, and he didn't often find a new, a new subject. And um, some of the big woodland uh, paintings that he did at Rothimarkus, Boat of Garten, towards the end of his life, are some of his best landscapes. But sadly, um, he would have felt, you know, uh, at the end of his life that he had much more to do, that perhaps, you know, the best was still ahead. And if you look back over his, his, his painting life, then you might be led to agree he could have had a wonderful late phase if, if he'd gone on to 80. You think of some great late phases of artists like Monet or Titian and why not Peplow? So it really was a curtailed uh, career. For Caddle, the loss of Peplow was like a premonition of his own death. He became so distressed here at the graveside that he had to walk away from the other mourners. It wasn't long before he himself fell ill. In 1936, he was diagnosed with cancer in his head. His doctors advised him to give up drinking. Bunty's response was typical. I've lived pickled, so I propose to die pickled. Now virtually bankrupt, death, it seemed, held no horrors for him. <laughs> 